Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jared Lee, and I'm a project scientist in the Research Applications Laboratory. And I'd like to welcome you all to a joint seminar between RAL and M-Cubed. Um, yeah, and so first, I'd like to welcome everyone who's here in the Zoom room, and also everyone who's watching the webcast. Uh, so just a couple of uh, housekeeping details. Uh, so, so for those of you who are in the Zoom room, uh, after the seminar is done, uh, we'd like you to use the raise hands feature uh, in order to uh, signal me that, uh, that you have a question. So to do that, um, down at the bottom of your Zoom bar, there should, you'll see, or you should see a reactions button, and then you can click raise hand from there. And then I'll see you in the list and, uh, and we'll call on you as there is time. For those of you on the webcast, uh, we do have a Slido operating just below um, uh, below the, the webcast window where you can enter questions there. And I'll do my best to um, uh, get to those questions as well. And also if any of you uh, have interest in giving a RAL seminar or know of a colleague at another institution uh, who would like to give a RAL seminar, just uh, yeah, please contact me. My email is jaredlee at ucar.edu. And so with the housekeeping details out of the way, now I'd like to welcome our speaker for today's seminar. So Paul Markowski is a distinguished professor of meteorology in Penn State's Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science, where he has worked since graduating from the University of Oklahoma with his PhD in 2000. He was one of the organizers of the second verification of the origins of rotation in tornadoes experiment, Vortex 2, and thanks to many generous colleagues, has been recognized for his tornado genesis research as the 2015 recipient of the AMS Meisinger Award, the 2013 recipient of the NWA's Fujita Award, and the 2011 recipient of the European Severe Storms Laboratory's Dotsek Award. He has served as chief editor of the AMS Journal of Weather and Forecasting from 2012 to 2017. And with that, now turn it over to Paul and the virtual floor is yours. Thanks for the kind introduction, Jared. Thanks for the invitation to visit Colorado virtually. I wish I was there in person. Uh, so what is the intrinsic predictability of tornadic supercells? Short answer is it depends. I'll explain what I mean by that over the next half hour or so. Uh, in the event that you find today's presentation interesting and, and want to learn more about it, you can read the gory details in a monthly weather review article that came out last fall. Lots of people to acknowledge, uh, but one person I want to single out is uh, my former colleague, Fuching Zhang, who uh, told me for years, maybe not to, he didn't quite put it this harshly, but uh, to not waste uh, my time trying to understand tornadoes so much, but to explore their predictability. Finally got around to doing this uh, late in 2019 and then uh, also occupied some of my time during the early part of the shutdown. Unfortunately, Fu Jing wasn't around to see what became of this, but uh, he was really the motivation for this line of work, which for me was really a completely new area. So uh, first off, showing tornado videos, it's always a winning strategy. Here's some red meat for the storm chasers in the audience. Uh, so one of these storms is gonna make a tornado, the other one won't. Uh, I don't know how long, Jared, it takes to get the, the betting pool going in the chat room on Zoom. Maybe betting's not allowed at, at NCAR. Uh, I'd argue that most storm chasers, no matter how experienced they are, can't just look at a storm visually heck, even with a radar and say, what that storm's gonna do in the next five to 10 minutes, will it make a tornado or not? Sure, sometimes we can look at a storm and say, this thing looks like it has very little chance of making a tornado in the next five to 10 minutes, but we've all seen lots of storms that look really promising, even imminently tornado producing and tornado never develops. Uh, for supercells, I would say the Practical predictability has been studied a lot more. This is uh, essentially our ability to predict storm behavior using the best available techniques. 
this study is really about what I guess I would better call intrinsic predictability. So if we have perfect data or perfect model, what are our limitations? When we look at tornado warning skill by various metrics, it's really kind of plateaued. So this is lead time here, computed using the weather service technique where they assign a lead time of zero if the warning comes out after the tornado forms. But if we actually exclude the cases where there's a warning that comes out late and just look at a metric called lead time in advance, this really hasn't gone anywhere in recent years, uh, really a couple of decades. And I could show you some other metrics of tornado warning quality. And most people would say they've we've kind of plateaued over the last decade or so. Maybe we've gotten a bit better at reducing outright misses, but our ability to predict the future hasn't really gotten a whole lot better. It could be that we're just butting up against predictability limits at this point. So here's what I did to study this problem in a nutshell. Uh, I ran an ensemble of 25 different supercell simulations. The only thing different in the simulations is uh, the location of convection initiation. And it's a really idealized initiation via a warm bubble. That's by design, actually. And uh, there are different random number seeds used to introduce small temperature perturbations at the initial time. So um, the, the simulations resolve uh, not just uh, tornado-like vortices in my supercell storms, but uh, they resolve, they're being run as LES. They resolve uh, turbulent boundary layer structures. And uh, so I've got different boundary layer realizations that I want to look at, okay, what impact do these have on, on the storms and on tornado formation? So um, here are some additional gory details of the simulations uh, used CM1, uh, shout out to George Bryan. Um, George uh, has supported this model uh, generously for uh, a long time, um, not to date George, but it's been decades. He's provided this as a service to the community. And uh, a grid spacing in the horizontal 75 meters in the vertical, it varies. It's the finest grid spacings are near the ground. Uh, relaxes a bit toward the top of my domain, the top of the domains up in the lower stratosphere. The boundary conditions are periodic. Uh, let's see, th these are idealized. So there's, there's no surface heat or moisture flux. There is a surface momentum flux, but there's no radiative transfer. There's Coriolis acting on the perturbation wind. So we're essentially assuming that the initial wind field that I define is a, a geostrophic wind field. And then uh, that's in, in balance with what we might call a pseudo horizontal pressure gradient force. It, it, you can debate whether that's the best way or, or not the best way to, to study supercells. Uh, there are reasons I don't care to get into right now for why I did it that way. Um, it's a bit of a long story, but uh, bottom line is my environment is really tornado friendly. There's a lot of convective available potential energy. There's a lot of wind shear. And uh, let me show you the sounding, by the way. So here is, um, this is the uh, initial sounding on the right. So this is the wind profile that is um, assumed to be kind of my background geostrophic wind profile. And then after 12 hours, it evolves to be long and curved in the boundary layer. And this is because of the surface momentum flux it's uh, because I've got some representation of the Coriolis force in the model. So this makes for a long curved low level hodograph. People who study severe storms would recognize that this is an extremely favorable environment for tornadoes. Uh, almost 3,700 joules per kilogram of Cape. Storm relative helicity, SRH, very high values. And STP is the a uh, significant tornado parameter that the Storm Prediction Center relies on. Values greater than one are considered large. So value of 6.1 is, is really upper end. This is uh, 
really an environment that favors extreme weather. Uh, on the left, what the animation is showing is the development of vertical motion at 500 meters in just one of the boundary layer simulations. So I spin up this boundary layer over 12 hours. You can see at times that early on develops horizontal convective rolls, but then those that's kind of a transient state. And by the end of the simulation, we kind of have somewhat disorganized, uh, but coherent turbulent boundary layer structures. Um, and, and we've got several realizations with each realization being produced by a different random number seed at the initial time. At 12 hours, is it exactly steady? No, um, it, you can sh probably show that it's impossible to have a perfectly steady boundary layer given this setup, but let's say that it's steady enough for government purposes. So at, at the 12 hour mark, what I do is stop the simulation and put in a warm bubble. And yes, that's an idealized way of initiating a storm. The real atmosphere doesn't make storms quite that way. But uh, the advantage of me having complete control over initiation is that I can take that as a source of unpredictability or as a limiting uh, predictability factor. I can take that off the table. So people who have studied predictability find that a lot of the divergence in outcomes is really dictated by what happens at initiation time or in the first 30 minutes of evolution. So we're taking that off the table here. What I do is I put in a warm bubble when I want, where I want. I have five different boundary layers and five different warm bubble insertion points. It's a way I, I use to generate 25 ensemble members. Uh, what's shown here uh, on the left in this 25 panel um, display is, uh, let me just tweak something, there we go, is uh, going down the rows from top to bottom. These are by five different boundary layers. The vertical velocity field is what's shaded. So if you go across left to right in one row, you'll see that the vertical velocity field is identical. Uh, the contours in black are theta prime contours, the plus one and plus two Celsius contours. So this is just showing where my warm bubbles have been introduced. So 25 different boundary, or 20, five different boundary layers, five different bubble locations gives me 25 uh, different simulations. It's kind of a, an inexpensive way to generate essentially 25 different simulations rather than running 25 boundary layer simulations for 12 hours, which is a bit expensive. And uh, here in red, this is some fine print. Uh, given that there's no surface heat flux, we maybe are, should best regard these simulations as taking place during the early evening transition. Actually, that's the time of day when most tornadoes occur anyway. So what do we get? So here, I'll, I'll start with the ensemble mean. So this is ensemble mean reflectivity color shaded. The white contours are the vertical velocity field and the blue contour is where the edge of the cold pool is, basically the gust front. And obviously this looks very supercellular. Uh, you can see one main updraft, you see storms splitting very early on. You see an echo appendage on the right rear flank of the storm. So even on the ensemble mean, we see what looks like a supercell, which means that the, the 25 members of the ensemble also probably look pretty darn supercellular if even the ensemble mean looks like a supercell. If we look at the variance of uh, velocity on the left, this is uh, the 3D velocity uh, and temperature on the right, uh, the reflectivity contours are overlaid in white just so you can kind of see where the, the, the high variance is with respect to the rest of the storm. We see most of the High variance is on the rear flank of the storm, particularly near the tip of the hook echo. This is really an indication that um, we have very different tornado-like vortices that form in the 25 ensemble members that gives really high uh, velocity variance in that part of the storm. And also uh, just in the rear flank outflow, there's a lot of variation. People who study storms that are in on this uh, seminar probably aren't surprised by this to see that there's more variability on the rear flank, less on the forward flank. And this is simply because the rear flank tends to be much more turbulent than the forward flank. Uh, 
Well, if we get beyond the ensemble needs, this is where things get, I think, a lot more interesting. Here are the 25 simulations and the white uh, streamers that are coming out of the storms. These are swaths of high vorticity. We, we can call these loosely the tornado tracks. And you can see that all of these storms are supercells. It's not, it would be really troubling if some storms were supercells, some weren't supercells. These are all supercells, all intense storms, all long lived. These storms would probably, the simulations carried out for two hours. If I carried it out for 10 hours, the storm probably would last for 10 hours and, and churn out tornadoes throughout the period. But when we look at these swaths, the, the, the exact time that they form, and I'll show you momentarily the intensity of the tornado like vortices that forms, it, it, it's all over the place. It's essentially unpredictable. And the thing is, is that these environments are identical in terms of planar averages in the environment. The only things different from one simulation to the other is the random number seed used to create the boundary layer realization. So in other words, the only thing ultimately responsible for this variability are the is the turbulent are the turbulent structures in the boundary layer. If we look at the swaths a little differently, so here's we'll call this storm number one. This is uh, where it makes its tornadoes in the model domain. Um, I've also shifted the swaths because I, I shifted the warm bubble positions around a bit. I, I basically removed that shifting here so that when I overlay the swaths in a moment, uh, you're going to see uh, that they form an envelope that's only about 15 kilometers wide. In, in other words, I, I said at the start of this presentation, what's the intrinsic predictability? It depends. Well, if your goal is just to predict whether you're going to get a supercell or not, or even whether we'll make a tornado at some point, I would say that uh, this is somewhat encouraging. This is a, a storm that was highly predictable, a long lived supercell. You could have issued a tornado warning for the storm hours ahead of time, potentially, and it probably would have been a, a pretty good warning. But if we're predicting the details, exactly when the tornado forms, how strong it'll be, how long it lasts, um, just not very predictable at all. So um, yeah, the, the width of the swaths kind of up in here is where the storm would be at about the two hour mark. You know, 15 kilometers isn't that much. I mean, that's much smaller than a, than a typical National Weather Service tornado warning polygon. If we look at tornado, the, the timing of their formation and how intense they are, what's shown here on the um, vertical axis is the ensemble member. So there's 25 rows, one row for each ensemble member. And then time is on the abscissa at the bottom. So um, most of the storms actually kind of have a lull at about the 60 to 80 minute mark. And then uh, when they make high end tornadoes, it's typically in the last 30 minutes or so of the simulation. Uh, most of the storms also kind of have an early spin up. Uh, I'm not sure how much we should read into the early spin up. It could be a lot of, could be some sensitivity to the warm bubble initiation at that point. Those details aside, bottom line here is that uh, tornadoes range in intensity from EF3 at the high end to um, at the low end marginal EF0. I mean, almost non-tornadic. Um, having said that, I would say that probably all of these storms would have deserved a tornado warning. So this is maybe not a good example of a case where you'd say that if your weather service forecaster, oh gosh, you know, you're, you're, you guys are screwed. You know, all of these cases probably warranted tornado warnings. But my point here is that at least in this part of the parameter space of environmental conditions, it would have been easy to, to issue a tornado warning, but, pr but predicting exactly when or how intense that tornado would be, forget it. There are other parts of the environmental parameter space, maybe on the low end of supercell where you're kind of near a multi-cell or supercell transition part of the, of the environmental parameter space where maybe some of the storms would be supercells and others wouldn't be. Or if I included, 
a more realistic initiation of convection that would probably only make things worse. So this is kind of, in many ways, you might consider this a best case scenario. This is an extreme environment where it's very tornado friendly and we've had this controlled initiation where I get to drop the warm bubble in to make a storm whenever I want. It doesn't really get any easier than that, really. Um, I'm going to call EF2 to EF3 uh, significant tornado cases or SIGTOR cases. We're going to look at the nine strongest. And then we'll look at the nine weakest cases. We'll call these the weak TOR cases. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to compare these storms and see if, if, there, if there's anything that jumps out that would have given us clues as to why the behavior is different. Again, any behavioral differences identified can only be explained by differences in the random number seed. Everything else has been held fixed here by design. So if we, I guess the first thing I wanna do is let's, let's look at when the warm bubble is introduced. So here's, uh, these are the, average over the nine weakest cases, the weak tor cases on the right, and the nine sig tor significant tornado cases on the left. This is the average vertical velocity field. It uh, looks like a kilometer above the ground when I put the warm bubble in. The warm bubble contours are shown in black. Uh, I guess this would be half a degree Celsius intervals. So, all right, I mean, we can see some differences here. I mean, the sig tor case, if I annotate this, you know, I kind of see updraft here, downdraft here, whereas in the weak tour case, you know, it, it's, it's different, I guess. Um, I, I, so, you know, of course, there are differences between these two cases, but um, I, I have no idea which differences are relevant. Um, I would argue that there's really no obvious reason based on this to expect different storm behaviors. Uh, resulting from these different initial kinematic fields and how they're related to the warm bubble placement. I mean, it, it really, in a way, it's as if, it's, it's a, to use the, the Lorenz proverb, there's a whole bunch of butterflies here flapping their wings. Um, what about if we look at mature storms? So um, before jumping into that, let's just, I've got like a five minute quick crash course on the latest understanding of how tornadoes form. Uh, this is actually a Colorado supercell, go figure. So uh, you, you, you're wearing your storm chasing hat, you're out uh, maybe an hour or two hours east of your office and you're looking at this storm, clearly a supercell, we see the mesocyclone. There's winds at the surface blowing toward the storm with a, an easterly wind component. There's winds above the ground with a westerly wind component. So there's a lot of vertical shear here, an implied horizontal vorticity in the environment. And that environmental vorticity, as parcels get sucked into the storm, the vorticity gets reoriented, it's tipped into the vertical. And that mothership spinning in the sky is just a visual manifestation of all of these air parcels and their vorticity being reoriented into the vertical. So we see uh, a strongly rotating updraft. And uh, this is kind of like football spin. It's what's called streamwise vorticity. The vorticity gets sucked into the storm and reorient and reorients it into the vertical. All indications are that that process isn't enough to make a tornado. Um, people have been trying for decades to demonstrate you can make a tornado that way. You really can't. You have to have, at least if there's not pre-existing vertical vorticity. If there's no pre-existing vertical vorticity, all indications are you need a downdraft. Storms have that. Downdrafts are ubiquitous. Um, certainly where there's precip, uh, the precip has some mass that can generate downdrafts that way. Some of the precip evaporates, generates uh, negative temperature perturbations, that also is a source of negative buoyancy in addition to the mass of the precipitation. In supercell storms, there's a significant area of negative buoyancy on the uh, forward part of the storm, a little left of uh, the storm track. And air parcels, because there's wind shear in, in these environments, wind shear implies that there's 
potential for airflow relative to the updraft. So at low levels, you long story short, you end up with flow of air relative to the updraft that approaches the storm from the forward side, passes through the rain and descends as it becomes negatively buoyant and supercell storms suck up some of this negatively buoyant air. Non-supercell storms don't suck up their own cold air. They're typically undercut by their own cold air and the gust front maintains non-supercell storms by lifting ambient warm humid air. But supercells can feed off of a mix of ambient warm humid air, but also some of their own rain-cooled outflow. Turns out the rain-cooled outflow is where all the action is. That's where there's significant augmentation of vertical wind shear, in part because there's a temperature differential. As we go from the rain cool air to the ambient environment. There's a horizontal temperature gradient that generates horizontal vorticity. And this is a, a, vort a vorticity vector on the forward flank of the storm. Following a parcel, this vorticity descends. It can be amplified via horizontal stretching as air descends to the ground. It can be amplified by the baroclinic generation of vorticity. And eventually it can be tipped vertically very close to the ground, uh, in part because air is descending as that vorticity tilting is occurring, or sometimes the, the vorticity just gets tilted abruptly upward at the surface if that air finds itself beneath a zone where there's very strong upward tugging of air. So this is how you get a tornado. You need to have this downdraft airstream. And if we now zoom in on what some people sometimes refer to as the business district part of the storm, um, now we, we, we don't quite have a tornado yet. Actually, we just have strong rotation about a vertical axis, but very close to the ground. To get a tornado, it's just amplification now, vorticity stretching or angular momentum conservation. These are the same thing in different terminology. So this angular momentum concentration occurs if there's very strong suction of air above, which forces convergence of the angular momentum at the ground. And also you don't want this air to be terribly cold. So all descending parcels that have been rained into probably have at least a little bit of negative buoyancy, but it's a bit of a Goldilocks problem. If you have a little bit of negative buoyancy, that's one thing. If it's very heavy air with a lot of negative buoyancy. It's very hard to draw that air upward. And if it's difficult to draw the air upward, then the, from just mass continu continuity arguments, it's hard to have the convergence of angular momentum that goes along with that. So if it's not too cold and there's very strong suction, then you can readily stretch the vertical vorticity to tornado strength. So, it's a bit, I mentioned the Goldilocks issue, you need downdrafts, you need cold air somewhere, but if you have too much cold air, that seems to be uh, detrimental based on where we're at these days with our understanding. As far as the suction, where that comes from, that comes from uh, this environmental vorticity. So all of the, in, in a way, you know, the most, one of the most important airstreams is the airstream that passes through the downdraft, but the suction effect seems to be tied to what's going on in the environment. This, and this is a good thing because operationally in a, in a weather service setting, we don't really know what's going on in the downdraft region, but we are able to assess what's going on in the environment, either from operational model output or the operational sounding network. So this is, this is a good thing. And uh, we can assess how strong this environmental vorticity is. And that is tied uh, pretty closely to the amount of suction that can pull up the negatively buoyant air. All right, so when there's strong suction, there's a uh, weaker low pressure aloft. When there's weak suction, the, the low pressure above is, is correspondingly weaker. And it turns out dynamic pressure, P prime D, this is the dynamic pressure perturbation. This is a function of the square of the vertical vorticity. So more vorticity means lower pressure. And the closer you can get this to the ground, the more uh, your vertical gradient of dynamic pressure is. And that's what's helping to suck the air upward. All right. So um, this video, this is one of my favorites. It really shows this, the rain cooled air getting sucked upward. You can see the rain shaft on the right. We're looking at a supercell from the south. 
can also see some rain on the back side of the storm. But look at the cloud tags getting sucked upward. You can even see rotation about a vertical axis, even a brief funnel cloud. Uh, it really getting a tornado it all comes down to whether the storm can suck up the angular momentum rich air. In the angular momentum rich air typically is not so easy to suck upwards depending on how cold it is. Um, just a footnote on this one outstanding question that's still being researched these days in my community is how much friction with the ground which generates horizontal vorticity to what extent is that as a vorticity source, a contributor to the tornado's vorticity budget? Um, I'd say that's TBD. Those of you who are on the, the, this Zoom that study um, turbulence and, and do LES, you've known for a long time that um, there are problems near the ground in LES uh, with, with resolving eddies and what happens to the vertical shear there. So uh, people who have studied this in the storms community um, this is this is a bit of a problem because our any vorticity budget that's looking at vorticity very close to the ground using LES, um, there's good reason to be skeptical of the outcome, I would say. All right, so back to the predictability problem. Um, oh, one, one other thing. So sometimes storm outflows just so cold, it just shunts the, the, the area of angular momentum away from the suction zone. That's yet another way you can short circuit tornado formation. All right, back to the predictability problem. So I'm going to look at the sig tor storms and the weak tor storms and look at the attributes of those storms that have been identified in prior studies as being able to distinguish between making significant tornadoes and not getting significant tornadoes. So negative buoyancy of the storm outflow, as I mentioned a minute or two ago, the colder it is, the less favorable the storm is for tornado formation, how strong the upward directed dynamic vertical pressure gradient is. We can look at that in the model. And we can look at where this, first off, how much angular momentum there is and where that angular momentum is with respect to the suction zone. Are there any differences in the weak tour versus sig tour cases? So, Again, uh, it's worth saying this over and over again. These environments are statistically identical. They're all favorable for tornadoes. So the million dollar question is, is there something going on between the storm's interaction with turbulent boundary layer structures that somehow causes the storm to have slightly different outflow or slightly different suction? And can we explain tornado formation that way? Um, the short answer is uh, no, not really. So this is a bit maddening actually, because you know, I've spent a lot of years, other people have spent a lot of years of their career looking at environmental data and they say, oh, when you have this type of environment, this is the likely outcome. When you have this type of environment, this is the likely outcome. Well, now I've run simulations in the same, and essentially same environment, I get all these different outcomes and I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, maybe Fu Ching was right. So uh, here's one way of looking at the output. These are time series of uh, individual ensemble members and then the ensemble means. The means are in the bold. Each member is in uh, pink or blue. Blue is a weak tor member, red is a sig tor member. So the red ones are the ones that make tornadoes. We can think of the blue ones as the wimpy tornadoes or, or marginal tornadoes. So a lot of noise here. If we look at the means, um, not that different overall. The stars are the times when uh, the differences in the means are statistically significant. So most of the differences are actually not statistically significant, except at a few cherry picked times. Uh, we got to be a little bit careful here because um, these, when there's a tornado in progress in a SIGTOR case, like an EF3 tornado, for example, that has a tendency to just dominate the ensemble mean. So if we look at the C here is circulation, it's, it's proportional to the angular momentum available to make a tornado. Zeta is the vertical vorticity component. It, you know, we see differences at these times uh, between the sig tor and the not in the weak tor cases, but um, this is we're really kind of looking at times when there's already a tornado in progress. So that, 
that's in a way that's kind of a truism. It, it's not really helping us understand why the differences are the way they are. Um, it'd be much better to kind of look at the SIG tour storms and the uh, weak tour storms right before they do their thing. So here, what I've done is looked at these SIG tour and weak tour storms at, at T minus five minutes, right before uh, either the tornado forms in the SIG tour cases or um, right before the weak tour storms look their most dangerous. And when we look at these cases, here are the SIG tour cases. The blue shading is a measure of how cold the cold pool is. Remember, too cold is not good for tornadoes. We'd expect SIG tour storms to have weaker cold pools on average. Uh, the black contours are where the updraft is most intense. Green is the, maybe it's not the best color choice. Uh, green is the outline of the storm's rain field. So you can kind of see hook echoes, for example, in panel C um, up here. This case looks particularly ominous. Um, those of you who study supercell storms, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, this is, you know, there's a heck of a suction zone here where this updraft is. I see a hook echo. Um, you know, this looks like this looks like it's about to make a big tornado, and that's not a surprise. In fact, all of these cases made EF2 and EF3 tornadoes. Um, but some of these particular cases at T minus five minutes look pretty lousy, actually. I mean, this case here, um, this does not look very threatening, honestly. It's hard to believe five minutes after this, this thing was making an EF2 or EF3 tornado. Um, I'd say, you know, that case looks overall not so threatening. In this case here in particular, um, I mean, I, I, here, there's a gust front way out to here with a lot of cold air behind it. This, it's hard for, I'd have to go back and look at the data to find out how this thing got its act together in the next five minutes. Uh, if I was storm chasing storm in panel F, I probably would have driven to another storm at that point. If we look at the weak tour cases, um, well, again, are these a, are there differences between these storms and the SIG tour cases? Yeah, but I, I don't know how we know which differences are the ones to, to latch on to. Um, yeah, so, you know, this case here in D, yeah, this storm looks not very threatening, but gosh, this one here looks potentially menacing. I see a really strong updraft here. This one as well. This looks pretty good. I see an hook echo kind of right in here. Um, very strong suction in this region here. Um, you know, there are a couple of candidates here that look, I think, pretty threatening. Um, here's, uh, what are we looking at? This is angular momentum in effect. This is circulation. And um, red means there's a lot of angular momentum. Yellow is a lot of, really a lot of angular momentum. And the same updraft field is superimposed. So where you see a strong updraft on top of angular, high angular momentum, that's just flashing danger. This is where we are very likely to spin up a tornado. So again, you know, this case looks a bit out of whack. There's a lot of angular momentum right here, but the, there's one weak updraft here and another updraft over here. But somehow in the next five minutes, this thing really got its act together. If we look at the uh, non-tornadic storms, or I should say weak, I should say weakly tornadic. I want to correct myself. All of these storms made at least marginal tornadoes. There really aren't any outright non-tornadic storms. Nonetheless, the weak tornadic storms, are there any differences that just recurringly, okay, these, it's always different in this way? No. In fact, um, this storm here is more angular momentum and this one here than any other storm, even in the SIG tour cases. Uh, this storm also has a lot of angular momentum, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, again, the butterfly flapping its wings, these storms were not able to pull it together and make tornadoes. Uh, if we do averaging, th these are the ensemble, or I should say the SIG tour mean cold pool and low level updraft, and compared against the weak tour uh, average cold pool and average updraft, you know, what are the differences here? Well, you know, the gust front, which is this line here, it's, a, you know, it's different in the SIG tour case. In the SIG tour case, it's a bit more inflected. I'm not quite sure what that means other than there's more rotation maybe in the SIG tour case, but we knew that already. Um, the updraft in the weak tour case is actually a little stronger 
then uh, on average, that is, then the SIGTOR updraft and the cold pool in the weak tor case. Uh, notice up here, the coldest air is only a couple of degrees colder than the environment. In the SIGTOR case, there's actually slightly more cold air up here. Although I will say that all of these storms have have somewhat weak cold pools, which has been found in prior studies, in fact, to be favorable for tornado genesis. So um, even the coldest cold air in any of the ensemble members here is still somewhat kind of what we would expect to find in a, in a significantly tornadic supercell based on observational studies. Uh, angular momentum differences, again, averaged in the weekly tornadic and significantly tornadic storms. The weekly tornadic storms actually have more angular momentum on average. It's just maybe slightly in a not optimal place. Here's the angular momentum centroid centered on the yellow. Here's the updraft centroid in the ensemble average. Again, ensemble averages can sometimes mask important details, of course. In the significant tornado cases, you know, here's where the angular momentum average centroid is. Here's kind of where the updrafts are. Is it a little more co-located? Maybe, but the updraft is a little weaker, actually. Um, this dashed line right here, this is showing a, a boundary layer updraft from the just the ambient boundary layer that's kind of feeding into the storm right before the tornado swarm. Is that the cause of the tornadoes in the sick door cases? I got no idea. I'm not even really sure how to evaluate that very easily, but um, maybe it, it could be something as subtle as that. If that's the case, uh, you know, operationally, the ability to predict whether that sort of thing might happen is, I would say, probably very low, maybe no chance. Uh, so to conclude, uh, circling back to the title, what's the intrinsic predictability? Again, it depends. That's what I started with. On one hand, the type of storm you get, the supercell that is, how uh, intense that storm is. All, the, the, all these storms had 80, 90 meter per second max updrafts. They probably all would have made gigantic hail. They all would have warranted tornado warnings. So that's extremely predictable. We could have issued a tornado warning hours downstream and it, it would have been really by any objective measure, a well-deserved warning. On the other hand, uh, the characteristics of the tornadoes, how long they last, exactly when they form, and exactly when means exactly where as well, certainly how intense they are, um, extremely limited. Uh, and in fact, I might speculate if we had finer grid spacing, 75 meters was the delta X here, if it was 25 meters, I think there's a really good chance instead of EF0 to EF3, we would have seen EF0 to EF5. Uh, could be the only reason we didn't get more intense tornadoes is because of the somewhat coarse grid spacing. Um, 75 meters, I know that's fairly high resolution by many standards. It, for tornado resolving, that's kind of on the low end. Um, if we look at tornado statistics, uh, what I, what I think is interesting to ponder is whether those would actually be more predictable. So here we got a certain uh, distribution of tornado intensities, and I could tie that to this certain environment with 3,700 3, cape and the, this amount of low level wind shear. It could be that for a less favorable environment, we'd have a, a weaker or a different distribution, but kind of shifted toward the weaker end of tornadoes with more non-tornado cases. Maybe for an even more favorable environment, there'd be a, a peak at EF4, EF5. I don't know, but um, I just want to allow for the possibility that here I'm saying you know, the tornadoes are unpredictable. Well, it could be that tornado statistics are actually more predictable. I don't know, uh, but I think in my lifetime, it'll be possible to do that sort of study where you have a certain environment and then instead of doing one simulation where you pump all of your computational eggs into one basket to do one single high resolution simulation, instead you do 25 or 50 or 100 of those and actually try to look at the distribution of tornado characteristics. As I mentioned before, in many ways, this is kind of a best case scenario that was studied here. We're not on the precipice of supercell versus non-supercell. We're solidly in the supercell regime. In fact, we're solidly in the, the high-end tornado regime. Uh, and 
predictability issues tied to initiation, not a factor here because of the idealized way by which storms were initiated. So it, it really probably worse than this if you were to make it more realistic. Um, just for fun, I didn't show any of these results. If I changed the initial temperature perturbations to 0.05 Celsius, they were 0.25 in the simulations I showed you. It actually doesn't matter. Uh, and this is actually not a surprise to those of you who study predictability. Lorenz predicted this would be the case. Uh, really doesn't buy you anything. And then um, one last implication uh, is that a single high resolution simulation to study relationship between a storm environment and tornado that results, probably of limited use. Because uh, you know, I've, I've shown here that if you just put in random perturbations to get different realizations of the exact statistically identical environment, um, you can get a whole range of outcomes. So um, I think kind of the, the way things will have to be done in the future is to kind of do this sort of thing where you, you look at different realizations in high resolution simulations. Right now it's a little tough because one simulation generates 50 terabytes or so, 50 to 100 terabytes, depending on what you're saving and how often. 100 terabytes is a big deal, but someday 100 terabytes won't be a big deal. And when it's not a big deal, we'll be able to do this stuff like it's nobody's business. Uh, this is my last slide. This is a, a quote I found in Scorer's book when I, on a day when I, I found it while looking for something else in Scorer's book. And uh, this is definitely bumper sticker material. The coming to terms with our limitations is actually much more satisfactory than it may seem because it amounts to making our objectives sensible. It's obvious that the deeper we probe into something, the more complex it seems to be. And in the case of indescribably complicated motion, the only road to simplification is to decide that there should, shall be limits to the complexity we're prepared to study. Favorite line right here, life is too short to spend it sorting out the infinite details of the flow on a single occasion, therefore you should go play golf. And anyone who did analyze them could have no assurance that the next occasion would be the same nor that anyone else would be interested anyway. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to uh, Jared, who can uh, moderate the Q&A session. Wow, thanks, Paul. That was fascinating. And I'm sure we're going to have quite a few questions. So just a reminder, uh, those in the Zoom room, uh, please use the raise hands function. And if you're watching on the webcast, um, uh, please type your questions into Slido. And we already have a couple here in, here in Zoom and one on Slido. So we'll start here in the Zoom room. And to no one's surprise, the first question goes to Morris. Hi, Morris. So, so Morris, could you unmute your camera and mic to ask your question? Unmute and unmute. Can you hear me now? I can, yeah. So nice to hear you. We, we Great, briefly saw cool. you too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stop my video, okay. Anyway, um, that was a fantastic presentation, Paul. I, I, you know, really, you deserve a lot of credit for that. I'm actually two hours east of Boulder right now. I'm driving towards Goodland, Kansas um, to chase a no supercells today. Well, I, I'm just kidding, actually. But there are a lot of people out there um, chasing today and asking these same kinds of intrinsic questions. Um, one aspect of the predictability that I don't think you addressed though, is the fact that laboratory studies of intense vortices seem to suggest that the nature and character of the vortices seems to depend on a ratio, the swirl ratio of updraft to angular momentum um, and whatever. And you can also different kinds of results for the intensity and the type of when they know or vortex stop ratio. Have you considered trying to look at vortex simulation? So the, the audio is a little choppy, but I think I, what you're asking is um, whether parameters like swirl ratio, in, in essence, what you're asking is, you know, if I looked at a few more aspects of these storms, would bigger differences jump, have jumped out. So that's a great question. I guess my answer to that would be on the swirl ratio issue, I probably don't have the resolution in these simulations to credibly assess that 
I mean, my, my first grid levels, it's uh, seven and a half meters. And then the next one's 37 meters. Horizontally, it's 75 meters. So these are kind of, I would say, marginally resolved tornadoes. And some, in fact, some would say you can't call these tornadoes. They're really tornado-like vortices because I'm not resolving a corner flow. And you really probably want to resolve the corner flow if you want to be computing stuff like swirl ratio. Um, the other aspect is, let's say I could, I probably would find differences, but would those be predictive or really just showing that there are differences once you already have a tornado, which wouldn't really be helpful for the predictability aspect? I don't know. It's a good question. I probably want to think about that a bit more. Thank you. Okay, well, for the next question, we'll stay here in the Zoom room. So Jim Brasseur, uh, could you unmute your camera and mic to ask your question? Hey, Paul, how are you? Hey, Jim, good to see you. Good to see you. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of technical uh, uh, detail kind of questions that one could ask about, you know, the simulation and the fact that a lot of the vorticity is unresolved, et cetera, et cetera. But um, more, more high level question, so there's a lot of emphasis, it seems, on trying to understand uh, the, the genesis of these uh, tornado-like uh, features on the um, creation of vorticity and the stretching of vorticity and the adduction of vorticity. But the stretching term, which is obviously critical in all of this, uh, most people think of it as something that simply amplifies the magnitude of the vorticity. But the reality is that um, you know, if you write out the vorticity equation, the stretching term actually has two parts to it. One is amplification of the magnitude of the vorticity vector, and the other is the change in the direction, the tilting of the vorticity vector. You can actually split it formally into two parts. Each of those parts involve an interaction between this local strain rate field and the local vorticity field. There's a lot of emphasis on the stretching part, uh, but not on the tilting part. And, and, more, and, and more importantly, there's a lot of emphasis on what the vorticity field looks like but not the strain rate field, which of course uh, is a tensor. Uh, so it has complex uh, structure, but those relationships are what determine the tilting and the, and the amplification and so on. So I'm wondering if there would be some value in first of all, separating the stretching term into those two parts. And secondly, uh, perhaps more importantly, not only examining the uh, evolution of the vorticity field, but perhaps as importantly, the evolution of the strain rate field uh, and all of these other related effects with buoyancy, et cetera, and how it, how it impacts all of that. So that's my question. Yeah, that was, uh, that's a good one. That, uh, gosh, that is, I feel like I'm in my uh, PhD comprehensive exam. That's a, definitely that level of question. Um, the best answer is, I don't know. Uh, P I, I think our field could really benefit actually from, outsiders come in and suggesting new essentially kinematic parameters to look at whether they're predictive or in other words whether they can tell us give us any insight as to what the next five minutes might look like versus maybe they only rear their head once we already have the tornado there that's also a question um people have looked at um a, a, a Kubo Weiss number um, that's sort of a little bit getting at what you're talking about. Um, this is looking at the difference between the, the, the spin and splat. Um, in, in, in a nutshell, you're right. There's more to tornado formation than looking at the vorticity equation. And certainly what we call tilting and stretching is a bit of a misnomer because um, the stretching also does some reorientation as well. Um, but right. I'd say, yeah, this is a good question. I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for it. The short answer is no, I didn't look at all of these right. possible things right. that could elicit it. Right. And, and, and we've already discussed the issues of near the surface and how LES has a problem near the surface, but uh, maybe it's time to renew these discussions between us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right, for our next question, I'll turn to Hugh Morrison. So Hugh, would you mind unmuting yourself to ask your question? Or if you prefer, I could just read it from the chat, but 
maybe so Hugh, if you, if you can, you can welcome, you're welcome to unmute your mic, but I'll just read your question for now, which you dumped in the chat. Um, you said, great talk, Paul. Does the method for CI matter at all? E.g., what if you use the nailer Gilmore with nudging method instead of a warm bubble? Might keep the updraft constrained longer? I guess in the end, it may not matter anyway. Flapping butterflies will win out in the end. Yeah, um, great question. I don't know the answer to that. Your, your speculation might be right. Um, one thing I did try um, is putting in, you know, taking my storm that made a tor one of my best tornado storms, freezing it at you know, midway through its life, right before it was going to make a tornado, and then running 20 ensemble members from that by introducing another batch of random perturbations just to see what would happen. And it turns out those perturbations just immediately get damped and they have almost no effect in the storm. So I can't even really evaluate that. I, I, the, the perturbations introduced into the initial state at t equals zero trigger instability, which then leads to these turbulent boundary layer structures, but um, introducing those same perturbations once I have a mature storm, it, it's kind of a different animal. So I'm, that's not really the question you asked, but it sort of is in a way, uh, a couple of reviewers brought this up as well. They asked, well, you know, if you had a data simulation system latch on to one of these prolific tornado producing storms would the predictability of that particular storm actually be, somewhat better than what I was advertising. And, and I don't know the answer to that. Okay, well, we'll do uh, one more question here in the Zoom room before switching over to Slido for a couple questions. But uh, so George Bryan, would you please unmute yourself? Hey, George. Paul, uh, thanks, Jared. So Paul, if, if one simulation has limited value for predicting and understanding tornado genesis, what does that say about field work, you know, where you get very limited data from one storm, you know, even just uh, particularly thermodynamics. So how do you think we should be using that uh, field project data in the context of, of what you said, uh, you know, 10 minutes ago? Yeah, I, I think that's always a limitation of field data is, how, how general do the findings apply? Um, we're, not re we're not resolving anywhere near these scales in field projects typically, uh, certainly not on the thermodynamic side, probably not even on the wind side. And, um, but the, the, about all we can do is base conclusions on kind of a longitudinal study of multiple storms and bend over backwards to state the caveats. Um, I don't know what else we can do other than just to sheer brute force and get more data so that we can maybe make some more robust in a statistical sense conclusions. Um, but should we do any field work? I think the answer is yes, because right now our simulation capabilities have actually really ran ahead of our observing capabilities. And we have to have some way of validating what the hell we're doing in these simulations. I mean, uh, the Rotuno and Clamp 85 paper is rich on this Zoom. I don't know if you I can't easily see the list. I mean, this is one of the landmark papers in our field. It showed through a material circuit analysis that for the first time that the, the, the baroclinically generated vorticity is what dominates the low level mesocyclones circulation budget. And that you know, over time simulations over the ensuing decade or decades showed a similar tale. Here we are in the 21st century you know, we put people on the moon. We're now putting stuff on Mars. We have this unbelievable constellation of satellites um, in orbit, and we actually don't have a 3D thermodynamic data set 
in a supercell storm to actually tell us whether the Rotuno and Clamp finding is actually, uh, Rich just chimed in, he's here. We, the, the Rotuno and Clamp 85 finding, which really sh I think was earth shattering, that this is yet to be observationally shown. That's, I think that's crazy. So I'll just um, add, go ahead. I'll, I'll just add real quick. I, I think you're right. I think the OBS help inform the modeling simulations and vice versa. So they're they're mutually interactive, you know, mutually beneficial. But uh, it, it's certainly not a very uh, you know heartwarming message to tell us <laughs> researchers that uh, you know the, the the work you're doing has limited value. Um, maybe you can find a softer way of saying that. No, I know. Talks. Well. And you know, the, the, the boundary layer people, have, you know, they would never think to try to worry about a specific U prime or V prime. This is why we have averaging, right? But you know, in essence, in the tornado community, the U prime can kill you. So we actually are trying to predict U prime, but in a way it just feels like a fool's errand sometimes. So we're gonna um, move over to Slido for, for one or two questions. Uh, thanks, Brett. So um, we'll start with a question from Jason Knievel, and he acknowledges that he asked this uh, before your, your summary slide, so I'll give you an opportunity to maybe comment a little more on it. But Jason asks, if your environment were slightly less friendly for tornadoes, but still friendly enough for some to form, might you find clearer signals of what discriminates between tornadic versus non-tornadic storms? In other words, could slightly less favorability lead to more predictability of tornadic versus not? So I, I don't think it would enhance the predictability. It might it make it easier to, for me to say, okay, this is why this batch of storms behave this way and this is why this batch behaved a different way. Me being able to attribute the outcomes like that is, is maybe fulfilling, but it actually doesn't make it any easier to predict those outcomes. Good question. Okay. Yeah, I, I, maybe that's not quite what Jason had in mind. Um, Lee Orff says she's heading out to play golf now, <laughs> taking your advice. <laughs> and um, then a question from Ben Green. Uh, basically, it looks like the smallest spatial scales, tornadoes, are the least predictable and the larger scales are the most predictable. Could Lorenz's calculations on predictability times as a function of space be compared to the results here? And by the way, Fu Ching would appreciate being told he was right. Yeah, so uh, Ben, that's a good question. So uh, forget which Lorenz paper it is, but if you kind of look, he's got a chart that shows uh, what he inferred to be uh, predictability time scale versus spatial scale. And I think it, when you're down at about 7,500 meters, it, it's something like five to, to, to 10 minutes, if I remember right. If, if I, um, I actually did look at uh, the growth of the variance of the ensemble, um, oftentimes when that saturates, people say that's what the predictability limit is. And you, I assume you know what I'm talking about because you're a predictability person. Ah, Lorenz 69. Thanks, Rich. Um, it's it, in my simulations, it, it saturates, in, in fact, at about 10 minutes, um, which is kind of the right ballpark that for what Lorenz predicted. Um, a reviewer that was in my original manuscript, uh, one of the reviewers really didn't like that because of. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity to, to phase differences. It really can kind of understate the predictability maybe, but um, I don't, this is not the most satisfying answer I'm providing, I know. But um, yeah, if I, if I, I'm thinking there might be a, a different way of quantifying predictability for my simulations. I just don't know what it is. But if I kind of use the off off the shelf method of looking at the time scale for variant saturation for what that's worth, whether it's the right one or the wrong one here. It, 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 in fact, that is 10 minutes, which in my simulations, that's before my warm bubbles even reach the equilibrium level. So things saturate basically right away. 
Okay, and we'll uh, have one final question. Um, we'll back to Morris. So Morris asks the first and the last question. So, uh, but he's certainly not least. So Morris, um, go ahead. This really echoes on Jason Knievel's question in that it seems like um, there's still hope to understand um, tornado genesis better, but I think what you need to do, Paul, is um, do your the same study for you know 50 more environments covering the whole range of environmental um, regimes you know, from multicell to supercell, and and then maybe we could see clearly what's different uh, yeah. among the different regimes. That'd be a great test for the 20 grad students that you have, I would think. First off, I don't have 20 grad students. Secondly, I wouldn't want 20 grad students. It's like, uh, yeah, anyway, it wouldn't be good for anyone. It wouldn't be good for them or me. Um, but I will say <laughs> that I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. And that sort of study is not really practical today, but I do think that's could be practical before the end of my career. But basically, when we get to the point where people can throw 50 terabytes around, like it's not a big deal, we can do that study. Right now, 50, you know, 50 terabytes is doable, but I'm just thinking about you know, sharing data with collaborators, moving things from one disk to another. 50 terabytes is still a little unwieldy, but when I, was, when I started grad school, two gigabytes was unwieldy. And you know that, that, that's a joke now. I send emails that are that big sometimes. Um, so yeah, once 50 terabytes is not a big deal, we can do exactly what you're proposing. Okay, well, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna wrap up the uh, webcast portion um, here, but uh, I'd like to once again, thank Paul for just a fantastic, fascinating seminar. Um, and, and one or two of you may still have a couple of questions. And so um, feel free to stick around in the Zoom room afterward and you can ask Paul, uh, ask Paul those questions more offline here. Um, but I'd also like to, before we um, hang up, like to advertise next week, we have another RAL seminar coming up um, given by Melissa Bukowski of RAL. Her seminar is entitled The Influence of Future Land Use Changes on Regional Climate Change Projections um, next Wednesday, 1 p.m. Mountain Time. So invite you all to come back then. And I uh, hope you all out there have a great Memorial Day holiday weekend. And thanks for attending. Thanks, Jared.